welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. Today is the Sunday before the Resurrection Sunday and in the Christian calendar we, we, we kind of put this aside as Palm Sunday. Ever, anyone ever heard of Palm Sunday before? Which is a celebration of when Jesus entered into Jerusalem on his way to the cross. And the people were so, uh, you know, joyous. They celebrated. They they screamed out Hosanna. They they said, "Blessed is the King, the King of Israel. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord." They laid down these palm trees and uh, palm leaves and, and their cloaks. They threw them off and they just worshipped him as he entered into Jerusalem. And it's a it, it was a, a big day. Uh, but there was more meaning to why Jesus was entering Jerusalem than just the, the praises of people. And uh, this morning, I want to look into that. But I want to ask if anyone, you, you've probably been to a wedding before. Has anyone not been to a wedding? Not, not been to a wedding? Pretty, yeah, everyone has been. I'm taking that as. Yeah, weddings are good celebrations, aren't they? They're good fun. I've had the honor of doing some weddings for people in this room today, celebrating their, their, their marriage and doing their weddings. And um, I just love going to a good wedding. Love going to the, 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 you know, the ceremony, but also the reception after. But the reception can get a little bit savage at times, can't it? Sometimes, depending on who's there. But there's typically two parts to a, a wedding reception that you've got to be careful of. Okay, one is the speeches, and you've got to be careful of who you let give a speech. That's one of my advice to, to any couple that I'm, I'm marrying, is just who, who, who you're going to give the microphone to. Make sure you know who they are. That's not the, uh, one of your crazy uncles that just jumps up and wants to say something at the wedding. But the other thing that can get quite um, savage is the bouquet toss. Okay, that, that one there, you at times need St. John's ambulance on site just in case it gets a little bit out of hand. Okay, now if you ever, I, I, I said before, I've been to a lot of weddings and, and I, I, I watch and observe a lot from what takes place in weddings. And I have now come to the place where I can discern a lady's relational status by the way she engages with the bouquet toss. Okay, I could sit back and I could tell you all the single ladies and where they are in their relationships by the way they engage in the bouquet toss. Okay, I can tell the one that is single, single, she doesn't have any relationship and she has no desire for a relationship. She'll tend to get up on the dance floor for the bouquet toss, but kind of stand at the back, not really involved, not really, really, you know, there, but just there for the fun of it. And then you'll see the, the, the lady who is uh, single but has a relationship and is not fully looking forward to marriage at this point in her life and she might come up to the dance floor for the bouquet toss as well and you know stand toward the back just there for the fun but then you have the lady who is in a relationship and her partner is not looking for marriage at that point but she is she will be front and center of the bouquet toss when the speeches are happening, when everyone else is eating dinner, she'll be running laps of the venue, doing push-ups, sit-ups. She's been training for weeks because she's going to get that bouquet and she wants her man to see it because she's going to lock onto that bouquet. And I have seen this take place. This is not a, a, a myth or a fairy tale. This is the reality that we live in where a lady sees that bouquet in the bouquet toss and her eyes become like fire and she looks and she locks on to that bouquet and anyone that gets in her way will be kung fu kicked, pushed, hair pulled, jumped on the back like in football, a big mark. You have seen it too. That's why you know. You know. You know. And they, 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 I've seen it. I've seen blood. 
blood on the dance floor where they've grabbed the bouquet and there's two ladies wrestling for it. And that uncommitted bloke is sitting there thinking, no. You can just watch his face as she jumps up on the pack to take them. And no. No. And she's like showing her trophy. But the thing is, she once she sees that bouquet, she is locked on. You cannot stop her gaze. She's fixed to this thing. When Jesus came to Jerusalem, he was on a mission. He had a purpose for going to Jerusalem. And there was nothing in all of the world that could deter him from fulfilling the Father's mission for him. As he came to Jerusalem, he was on assignment from the Father. And there were things that came against him. There were things that came up throughout his whole life, throughout his whole ministry. But he went to Jerusalem with a purpose. I want to read from Luke chapter 9, just a a text that perhaps um, we can skip over really, really easily as it's not necessarily a, a... an often spoken of text, but it's actually really, really important and gives context and purpose to why Jesus was in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday in the first place. It's Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. So Jesus is, is on mission. He's, he's doing all the things that the Father has given to him to do. He's walking through different villages and towns. He's healing people. He's teaching. He's teaching parables about the kingdom of God. And then it says in verse 51, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And he sent messages ahead of him who entered into a village of the Samaritans to make preparations for him. But the people did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. Now, as I said, you could just read through Luke and and, and see this as maybe that's the next part of the, the picture or the part of the stage or that's just the next part of the journey for them. But this is a really, really important point. Because it's from this point, it says that, that at this time, Jesus knew that he was being taken up, that he was about, the, the time was drawing near for him to be taken up, that, that the time was coming when he was about to be killed, where he was about to be uh, crucified, where he was about to be uh, put to death. That time was coming. And at that very time, Jesus knew where that would take place. And so he sets his face toward Jerusalem. Now, we could understand that in a, in a geographical kind of location understanding that Jesus turned around and faced Jerusalem, that he, he then uh, started moving toward Jerusalem. But there was something much more uh, deep at play here with this passage. We see in Isaiah chapter 50, verse 6 and 7, it's a messianic pre- prophecy. It's speaking of the Messiah who would come. And it says in verse 6, I gave my back to those who would strike and my cheeks to those who pulled out the beard. I hid not my face from the disgrace and the spitting, but the Lord God helps me. Therefore, I have not been disgraced. Therefore, I set my face like flint and I know that I shall not be put to shame. This is speaking of the Messiah that would come, the pain and the suffering have to go through. But his trust in God caused him to set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. It says here that he set his face like flint. That word flint is, is like a rock, a flinty rock. It, it, it is like a hard rock. It is like he was determined. He was resolute in his decision that his face was set toward the Father's purpose for him. So as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, he does, not, he does it not just to, to kind of have a party and to get the praise of, of, of all the people. He's on mission to die. Jesus was determined to die. Jesus was determined to die. Now, that doesn't sound like a very encouraging sermon title. But there is something in this for us today 
that I hope we catch. It's that Jesus was undeterred by the things that would come against him as he went about what the Father had given him. As a church, as Christians, if we have the same sort of determination in our hearts to fix our face towards him, to look to him, to set our face like flint towards Jesus. And regardless of what happens around us, to keep our eyes fixed upon him. When the the good times come, to keep our eyes fixed upon him. When the tough times come, our eyes fixed upon him. And the things that he has us to do in this life, the assignments that he's given us, the purpose that he has put within us, that we would set our faces toward it. And that nothing that took place in life would throw us off track. You see, Jesus went toward the cross with such purpose and with such determination. His face was set. He was looking toward Jerusalem and not just the geographical. That meant that he was ready. He was looking toward what would come. He saw that that he was about to suffer. He knew that he was about to go through all of these trials and this agony and that he would be put to death. And yet he determined in his heart that he was going to go. He was not going to be put off. Give me 10 Christians. Only too many. Just give me a handful. Well, it's probably two handfuls, 10. Of Christians who say, no, no matter what, no, no matter what, I'm following Jesus. No matter what comes up, no matter what happens, I'm determined, my eyes are fixed upon Jesus. Nothing is going to take me from the left or to the right. I'm going to face him. I'm going to walk toward him. The things that he's put within my heart, I'm going to follow those things. I'm going to live out the purpose of God regardless. That is the determination in my heart, that I'm going to set my eyes upon him and that I'm going to follow him. Give me 10. Give me 10 and I'll show you something. I'll show you the world change. I'm not talking about cotton wool Christianity. Where we follow when it's convenient. Where we we say I'm good in the good times and and, and I'm not there in the bad times. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm up and I'm down. I'm, I'm here or I'm there. I'm in one day, I'm out the other. Or a Christianity that, that, that kind of bubble wraps itself from the, 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 the scorn of the world, the difficulties and the trials that might come. That says, I'm, I'm in it for the, the good times. I'm in it for the men's camp. That's a good camp. Go to men's camp. But when other things happen, then I'm out. I'm talking about a, a determined heart that is set upon Jesus that is set upon his purposes, and that says, no matter what comes, I'm going to follow him. Can I tell you what I've been feeling recently? Uh, I've been feeling that there is this pushing of darkness toward the church, that the enemy's agenda, his plan, let's let's not be um, ignorant, that we have an enemy who is trying to uh, thwart the, the plans and the purposes of God. And in doing that, he's going to try and come against his church. He's going to try and come against us. And I've felt like the, the enemy's trying to take ground. But I get this sense that we are to stand. And to say no. And to say, regardless of what comes at us, we're going to take ground for the kingdom of God. That we are going to stand and not be deterred. That we are not going to be intimidated. That we're going to stand with passion, with boldness, with faith and say, no, the enemy, the kingdom of darkness can try to advance, but the church is going to stand and say, no, I'm not going to run. I'm not going to back down. I'm not going to take a backward step. I'm going to stand my ground in Christ by his grace and say, no, enough is enough. Don't back down. I feel to say don't get intimidated by the things that are coming against you that would try to break you down, that would try to make you quit, that would try to discourage you. 
Jesus had to face all of these things on the pathway to his purpose. He had to face the difficulties. He had to face the the, the praise of humanity. He had to face all of these different things that could take him off track. And yet he set his face toward God. To set your heart toward him. To say that that is my God and that is the direction that I'm going in. We see this this, um, throughout scripture. There's actually different examples where we read this, this thing called uh, setting your heart. You know, the, our, our culture tells us, one of the biggest lies that our culture tells us is, is you just got to follow your heart. You know, what, what are you going to do in that decision? Just follow your heart. Like, just, just do whatever's in you, whatever makes you feel good, just kind of follow your heart. No, you actually have to lead your heart. You actually have to point your heart in the right direction. You actually have to set your heart on something, on someone. And then let that determine your direction. Let that determine your devotion. I think that's why Jesus teaches us with finances in particular. Because he says what? Where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So he he then tells us to, to give to the poor. Why? Because I think that when we give to the poor, we're leading our heart in that direction. You give your treasure, you're you're, you're leading your heart into that direction. You're not just following it. Ezra Ezra 7 verse 10, it says, For Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord, and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. Ezra had set his heart. He had made an internal decision that I am going to teach, that I'm going to learn, that I'm going to read, that I'm going to know the word, that I'm going to study the law, and that I'm going to live by the law. He made the determination in his heart. Daniel verse uh, chapter 10, we heard this last week, that in verse 12 it says, Then he said to me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you set your heart to understand and humbled yourself before God, your words have been heard, and I have, be, I have come because of your words. Daniel had set his heart toward God to humble himself. He had made a decision to, dis, to, to lead his heart, to, dis, to set his heart. And then we see in Second Chronicles 12, 14, speaking of Rehoboam, that he did evil, for he did not set his heart to seek the Lord. He didn't set his heart, and therefore he did evil. He, he was just kind of going about life and doing whatever he did, what, maybe whatever felt good, whatever everyone else was doing, whatever he heard from different kingdoms, whatever, whatever felt good in his own eyes. But he did not set his heart on the Lord, and so he did evil. Can you see what happens when we don't set our heart? When we don't make that decision to, I'm determined to follow Jesus. Now here's the tension point that we have to, to, we've got to wrestle with. Determination in our hearts, a, a resolution toward God with grace. So it's not just about willpower. It's not just about me gritting my teeth and trying the hardest that I can in my own strength. Grace actually empowers me to make the decision, to make the determination, to, to make that, 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 that resolution in my heart that I'm going to follow him. Grace enables me to do that. It's by his grace and my response to it. And his grace also empowers me to live that out. His grace enables and empowers me to live like this. So it's not just a, a, a gritting of the teeth, a stomping of the foot, uh, uh, making it my own willpower. It's me, me responding to the goodness of God, His grace, and saying that I am in. And no matter what comes, I, I'm in. I'm following you. I was thinking of the, the, the early church, you know, the, the, our brothers and our sisters that went before us. Who, who gave their lives, who were persecuted, sawn in half, thrown into the lions. Who, who, who said, no matter what, like literally no matter what, like seriously, no, I'm not just saying no matter what, and then it starts raining and I'm not going to church. I'm saying no matter what. Like, no matter what, I am following Jesus. 
You can take my riches, you can take my, my family, you can take my life, but I'm not stopping. I'm following Jesus. He is my reward. He is the one that, that, that I'm, I'm seeking after. Nothing else, no one else, just Jesus. And I'm inspired by their faith, their willingness to lay down their lives. And then I'll ask, I'm challenged by that as well. I'll say, do I have the same kind of heart? Am I in the same boat where I would just give it all for him? Not just what I want to give for him, but all of it. My whole life, every area of my heart, every area of my calendar, my finances, my relationships, to give it all to him. Regardless of what happens. Am I willing to follow him with everything that I have? So as Jesus comes to Jerusalem and he, he's greeted by the, these crowds, they cry out. They cry out, Hosanna. They welcome him in. They're, they're, they're glad that he's there. They're excited that he's come. They're like, yeah, yeah, they're throwing everything on the floor. Let's worship him. And then less than a week later, they're crying, crucify him. Kill him. We don't want him. There was two cries that Jesus heard in that week. One was the cry of human praise. And then just a few days later, he heard the, the cry of human pain. He heard in one week, Hosanna, you're the king of Israel, the blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna, worship you, we praise you, we give you this human praise. And then just a few days later, he's standing there on trial, innocent, yet brought before trial. And, and the people are crying, crucify him, kill him, we don't want him. And they're like, well, isn't he your king? I mean, you guys were crying out king before. Now, now, now he, he's not our king. And they mocked him and called him the king of the Jews. And they put a crown on his head, a crown of thorns. And so he had to go through these two areas, right? He had to deal with human praise and human pain. And I put it to us that if we want to follow Jesus, if we want to be determined in our, in our minds and our hearts to follow him with everything that we have, we're going we're gonna to encounter these two areas in life. We're going to have to encounter and navigate human praise. And we're going to have to encounter and navigate human pain. Now, both of these areas can detour, can cause a detour or a deterrent to us in following Jesus. We might understand more the human pain aspect, but what about human praise? How do you go with success? How do you go when you are making a difference, when you are influential? As Jesus at this point was, they were, they were praising him. They recognized what he was doing. They saw the things that were taking place, and they heaped praise upon him. Now, what would have happened if Jesus just set up a little throne and took that praise. You know, he didn't come for the praise of man. He came for the praise of God. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't live by the praises of the people around him. He, he, he lived for, for, for the, the gaze of his father. And so he wasn't thrown out by the praises of people. So what happens to us when, when things start to go well? when maybe you get a bit of attention for uh, the gift that you have or uh, the ability that you have or the way you carry yourself. I've seen this sidetrack people before. Gifted people, called people, anointed people who, who, who their gift makes space for them, makes room for them, and then they get sidetracked by the allure or the illusion of fame, of praise of other people. You might hear this, you know, well, that person had humble beginnings and now they're a megastar in the Christian circles. You know what? You ha I think you have humble beginnings and humble continuings. It's not that you have humble beginnings and then you grow out of that and you become some sort of big person. It's humble beginnings, humble continuings, humble endings, glory. 
Not that I'm just trying to start off small and then try and big and become someone bigger and, and more influential. And, and this used to grieve my heart when I first got into ministry. And I'm not trying to have a crack at anyone. But something I observed that, that really, really grated my, what's the saying? Grated your gears? Just really upset. I don't even know that saying. Just really upset me, right? Was the, the kind of, it was almost like a, a Christian celebrity kind of culture where those who were gifted and, you know, had some sort of talent or anointing were kind of put on the pedestal and everyone was to look to them and, and it was kind of like, wow, that person's anointed, that person's great and, and you wanted to kind of be like that. But if you, you weren't like that, then you kind of felt like you were insignificant. And I remember talking to people and one of the first questions that people would ask at these kind of uh, pastors' conferences and stuff that we, we, we'd go to was, hey, how big is your church? That was one of the first questions. How big is your church? It's not my church anyway, but... And, and what does that say to us? Well, that, that kind of says, like, there's a little bit in there that we see significance in size. Or that we, we probably feel like we're more anointed, talented, gifted, called because of the size of our church. And then there was a preface put in there, because I think God started dealing with that, and it was like... Not that it matters, but how big is your church? Kind of like, not that, but you ask, so it does matter. And that whole idea that, 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 that you kind of become something in, in that, that Christian celebrity kind of idea. I don't think that's what Jesus was looking for when he walked to Jerusalem. When he came in and, and, and everyone laid down their things and they praised him. He didn't set up camp there. He didn't like pull out, pull out the guitar and start to, to, come on guys, just praise me, just make me feel good. Like, like he had a, a purpose and it wasn't to accept their praise, it was to die. It was to die. Literally, I've had to struggle with this and wrestle through this. You know, when, when I remember people saying like, you kind of want to get, Build a platform in ministry so that people know you and then you get the invitations to this and that. And, and it's like, really, are we doing that? I, I'm happy that when I walk through the primary school next door that some of the year six boys will say, hey, Scott, do you want to come and play basketball? I'm happy to be known by people in the community, not to be pedestalized or put onto a... You know, some sort of poster. And, and, and that's one thing with ministry, but what about with work, with your employment? What happens when you start to be successful and you start to get the promotion? The amount of times that we've seen it that people are following Jesus with everything they have and then, then comes the, the promotion and the power and the praise of man. And how do we deal with that in our hearts? It is a great test of your character with how you deal with power. When you are given authority, when you have people that you are leading or people that you are, uh, you've got employees or, or whatever it might be, it is a great test of your character in how you are. Can I say that we shouldn't change based upon those things? That we should function from who we truly are. But we are tested in our character in these areas. So every promotion is an opportunity for us to, once again, give it over to God. Not to, to be drawn away from the purposes of Him. The purpose that He's called you to. To seek Him, to know Him, and to make Him known. The human praise. How do we go with those, those compliments when you've done a good job or when you're... Uh, you know, you're starting to, to, to win at life or whatever it might be. And people come and they pat you on the back. How, do they go to your head? Do they affect us? Maybe you've seen it as well where people just kind of get off track because of those things. Jesus here is being praised on Palm Sunday and rightfully so. If you're going to praise anyone, praise him. And yet he doesn't stop there. He journeys through Jerusalem to this place now where he's experiencing human pain. Where they're saying, crucify him, kill him. We don't want him. Do you know how close those things can be at times? 
Do you know how fickle humanity is? And if we live for the applause of people, we die by the criticism. Because what happens when you experience disappointment? Jesus had to to go through this, right? We see that he, he, he comes into Jerusalem and then what happens? He gets betrayed by one of his men, turned over. He's betrayed, he's sent away, he's, they, 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 they leave him, they abandon him, they hand him over. How do you deal with that? I mean, when you feel betrayed, relational pain, when you feel disappointment, when you feel like you've been wronged, when you've been falsely accused, how do you deal with that? Once again, I've seen it take people off track. They're following Jesus, they're, 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 they're loving him, and then something happens, and the pain, the hurt, which is real, it, it, it takes them off track, it, it, it leads them in the wrong direction, and they respond from that place of hurt, and that place of, of, of trauma, or uh, anger, or whatever it may be, rather than from that place that they were at. Physical pain. I mean, I know people who have chronic illnesses that they, 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 they feel debilitated. They feel like they can't do what they, they're called to do because of that. At times, they, they move into different things, start to medicate with the other things to try and ease some of the pain. How do we deal with human pain? How do we deal with... Here's a big one. Church hurt. How do we deal with hurt that we experience in church community. There is a good chance that many people sitting in this room are sitting in this room because you have left the church, you've left a community where you were hurt, where you experienced something that you shouldn't have experienced. And then that sours your expression or your understanding of community and church. How many times do we hear this? Done with church. Uh, I'm happy with Jesus. I'm good with him. But not the church. Because there's been hurt there. Things have been said. Things have been done. There's been abuse. Maybe there's some, some, th- some things that happen. Now sometimes it's not, sometimes it's our perception of that. And we've got to own that. Sometimes it's, I felt like that person wronged me. But they didn't actually. I had to work through this. It was my own immaturity that caused that tension. And I can't just kick them out or leave because of that. It's, it's my own stuff that I've got to deal with. But how do, we, how do we walk through that? How do you do life with a broken, messed up community and still love each other genuinely? And still follow Jesus passionately together? Can you see what I'm saying? Like This can take people off track. I wonder how many people have kind of just left or walked away because it was too hard or because they were too hurt. And yet Jesus goes to the cross. He experiences the the, the depth of human pain. He's whipped. He's beaten. He's crucified. And yet he was determined that through human praise and through human pain, I am going to serve God. I'm keeping my eyes upon him. My face is set like flint toward Jerusalem, toward the Father. That I'm not going to be deterred. And as we enter into this holy week, as we start to consider the cross and we start to consider the resurrection, I I, I feel to call us to that place of total surrender to him. Dependence upon him. Where we say, I am determined to follow Jesus with everything that I have. I'm thankful for passionate people like Jake, who who in a young age is an example of someone who chooses Jesus first. This guy inspires me. I'm thankful for people like Andrew and Wendy, who have made decisions to move countries because of what God has said to them. To lay everything behind. Relationships, houses, 
stuff to follow what God said, even though they didn't know exactly what God was saying to do or where to go. To determine that this is it. I'm in. I'm all in. I'm not half in. I'm not in this week and out next week. I'm not doing the, the, the Christian calisthenics. I, I'm in. Like this is it. Life or death. I'll finish with this passage here from Joshua. Just felt this as we were praying this morning. And if your team, you guys want to come up. When Joshua says to the people, In Joshua 24, verse 14, it says, Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods. Throw away the gods your ancestors worshipped beyond the Euphrates River in Egypt and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourselves this day who you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. You can make a choice. You can choose to serve the gods of your ancestors. You can choose to serve whatever you want. But then he says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're making the decision that we are going to serve the Lord that my face is fixed on him and I won't be deterred no matter what happens no matter what comes can we close our eyes and just focus upon him I want to pray this morning but I also want to call us to that place of you know what I want to stand for Jesus I echo those words that as for me I'm not looking around at what everyone else is doing but as for me I'm going to serve the Lord and I'm going to take a stand I'm going to stand for him and sometimes the physical act helps us to understand what's happening spiritually so I want to pray, but I want to pray, I want to call us that if, if this is for you, that you say today on this day that I want to serve the Lord, that I'm determining in my heart that it is Him and Him alone, then I want to ask you to stand with me, to stand to your feet as a sign that me, as for me, I'm not looking around, I'm not worried about who's standing next to me or who's sitting behind me, but as for me, In my house, I will serve the Lord. That through the the journey, the highs, the lows, human praise, human pain, everything that's encountered, I will serve the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you that there is only one worthy. We thank you that there is only one worthy of praise. There is only one worthy of our sacrifice and our surrender. And today we say that we surrender to the one, the one who came, the one who gave his life, the one who has called us, adopted us, chosen us, purposed us. God, the one who has saved us and redeemed us has set us free. And we're not looking at what the world is saying. We're not looking at what other Christians are saying. This is my decision that as for me and my household, as for my heart, I will serve the Lord. God, we surrender afresh to you today. We pray that you would do what only you can do in our lives. I pray your grace upon grace upon grace to fill us, Lord, to to overflow in our lives. That we would know without a doubt that we are called by you. And in those moments, Lord, when we feel to to go off track, when we're, we're pulled to the left or to the right, that your grace would apprehend us, that by your grace you would call us back, 
Father, we thank you. We thank you for what you can do with a surrendered heart. But above all, God, we want you glorified. We want you to be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. There's a line in the sand. And from this day on, come what may, I exhort you to serve Jesus and Jesus alone. I exhort you to keep your eyes fixed upon Him. To not look to the left or to the right. To look only to Him and allow Him to do what He wants in your life. In Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.